you ready? Sorry, we're a few minutes behind. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and um, we'll kick off the afternoon session. Hopefully, but everybody's back from the lunch break. Um, so starting us off, uh, Brian Schultz, uh, Acting Assistant Professor from our Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, uh, will be talking to you about managing distress through the cancer treatment process. Brian, thank you. Okay, thanks. Welcome back from lunch, everybody. Uh, I'm a faculty member at the University of Washington. I also see patients at SCCA. Uh, and what I want to do today is talk about distress. What is that? How do we experience it? Why is it important? And what can we do about it? So we know that cancer impacts us in a whole bunch of different ways, including obviously biological, definitely psychosocial, and these things really intermingle and act on each other as well. <clears throat> okay, the fonts are a little squished together, but um, in general, some of the physical aspects of, of cancer and the treatment of cancer affects us in physical ways. We know some of these like fatigue and nausea and pain, cognitive issues like Word finding problems where I'm not thinking as fast as usual, or trouble sleeping like night sweats. And a lot of these things also are things that we experience even if we're not having a medical problem, but just having distress. And the psychosocial impacts of cancer are varied, and there's a lot of them. They affect us as individuals, our role in the world and in our families, our spirituality, our finances, our quality of life, but also those who are important to us, our friends and our family. And these kind of impacts can also affect how we're feeling and how we're able to function and the things that we want or need to do. So what is distress? Briefly, it's just, it's an unpleasant experience of various natures, but mental, physical, social, spiritual natures. And it can range from anything from a normal sadness, sadness when we experience something that would make us sad to severe and disabling, like a severe depression or anxiety or a spiritual crisis. And I'll talk about this in a bit. It can not only be uncomfortable and unpleasant, but can actually interfere with our ability to cope in our lives and, and in our treatment for cancer. What can distress look like then? It can look like a whole bunch of different things. It can look like sadness, or fear, or feeling helpless, <clears throat> or anger, feeling out of control, questioning our faith, or questioning what's my purpose in life now. <clears throat> it can look like we're isolating or we're pulling away from people. Distress can result even in poor sleep and poor appetite beyond what treatments or a medical illness even is doing. It can result in depression, anxiety, we'll talk about that. And it can result in frequent thoughts of, of illness and death beyond what is <clears throat> typical or what is, what is helpful, essentially. There can be a lot, of, a lot of fear. And those thoughts can just keep coming and, and not be helpful for us after a while. <clears throat> so who experiences the stress? Well, everyone impacted by cancer at some point experiences some form of distress. So you are not crazy if you experience distress. It's a very normal experience. Unpleasant, but, but normal. Now up to 50%, we know from studies, up to 50% of cancer patients actually experience a more significant amount of distress. And we'll talk about that and what does that look like. But also distress can, can really occur at any time. There are specific times during the cancer process that it may be more typical to experience. And so be aware that these potentially are more challenging times. For example, certainly getting assessed or being diagnosed with cancer for the first time can be very distressing. Starting treatment or even completing treatment can be a distressing time because there's unknowns about that sometimes. I talk to a lot of folks who have a lot of anxiety about getting to a scan or getting to a checkup and what is the scan going to show. Uh, all of these kinds of things through survivorship, surveillance, if a disease recurs, certainly distress, and then end of life kind of issues. But really, distress can happen at any time. Why is it important to recognize? It's important because it really can affect a lot of part of our lives. 
It can make physical symptoms worse. It can result in our being less satisfied with our care, our lower functioning just in general in life, longer hospital stays, lower quality of life, and actually higher mortality. And <clears throat> this is important to explain. Having anxiety or having depression, it's not going to affect what the cancer is doing. As far as we know, it doesn't affect how the chemotherapy works or how the radiation works. But if we're distressed enough, it may affect our ability to get to those appointments or to, to take the medications or get to the radiation uh, and to be able to take care of ourselves and follow our doctor's recommendations in order to do the things we need to do. So that's why one of the reasons distress is really important. Now, when it does get to a pretty significant point, it can become something like a clinical depression or a clinical anxiety. And depression and anxiety often actually go hand in hand together. About 50% of cancer patients will at some point experience what we could actually call a psychiatric diagnosis or a disorder. 50% of cancer patients have distress but don't necessarily have trouble coping with it or have trouble getting to do the things they need to do. 30%, about 34, 35% of folks may have what we call an adjustment disorder in psychiatry, which is we are responding to a stressor or a traumatic event and our ability to cope with it isn't, our abilities aren't quite working as well as, as we want them to. Uh, so it's causing us problems. And then about 15 or 16% of cancer patients will have a major diagnosis in psychiatry, like a major depression, a major anxiety. And this includes folks who had a major depressive disorder before cancer, or a major anxiety before cancer, and certainly having cancer can exacerbate those kinds of symptoms. Well, how do we recognize depression? Depression can come in lots of forms. And these are some examples of what people with depression experience. And know that usually for a major depression, it's, it's actually multiple of these things happening at once. So low mood is one part, which may seem fairly obvious. But there's other things that we would want to be aware of, like decreased enjoyment or pleasure, or just decreased interest in the things we usually do. Change in our sleep or appetite, and that can be more sleep or less sleep or more appetite or less appetite. Uh, poor concentration, feelings of guilt, of worthlessness. And then sometimes it can, depression can result in suicidal thoughts. And, and this can even take a range of forms as well. Some people can feel sometimes like, you know, if I went to sleep tonight and I didn't wake up, that would be OK with me. Uh, and then it can range all the way to, I actually really don't want to be alive anymore, and I'd like to do something about that. Uh, and it, in the case of depression, then we want to be able to know about that and identify that and, and help folks through that. What is not depression? Depression is not a normal kind of experience that we would expect of sadness. Sadness can be normal. And, and pretty expected. So just sadness is not depression. Depression is not a normal part of cancer. It's also not something that will just go away. It's not a sign of weakness. Uh, and it's um, something that we really want to know about and address. So that's depression in a very brief nutshell. Anxiety can be identified as panic, as an irritable mood, excessive worry, like I, I can't shut my brain off. I just I can't get to sleep. I've got this worry that's just spinning me around and around. Or restlessness or impulsive behaviors. By the way, these are example, just examples. This doesn't define totally depression and anxiety. There are some things that if we're starting to notice some distress, or even before we start to notice distress, that we can do for ourselves. For example, continue to do the things we enjoy. Stay physically active, intellectually active, socially active. Maintain uh, our daily structure, focus on things we have control of, and maintain our principles and our, and our values to make sure that the things that we are spending our time on and are doing are honored. 
Okay, some other things. To rely on ways of coping that have helped in the past. So for example, if my way of coping is to talk to people, then I should reach out and, and talk to people. If, my, if I'm not a talker, though, then my way of coping may be more like taking a walk or doing meditation or maybe even talking to a spiritual, a spiritual leader in my community. So do the things that you know have worked for you in the past. Take it one day at a time. Something important is that it's, it is okay to not have, it, have a positive attitude all the time. Some people feel like, that works for me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be strong and have a positive attitude all the time and show people that I'm positive. But that's not everybody, and that doesn't work for everybody. And we don't need to successfully treat cancer by having a positive attitude all the time. And sometimes that's just not realistic. Don't suffer in silence. Let people know. Please try not to be embarrassed to ask for help. So elicit support from your friends, from family, and especially your providers. But sometimes there are barriers to getting help. And one of those may be a fear of stigma, like they're going to think I'm crazy if I talk about what I'm experiencing. Your providers want to know if you're having distress, if it's physical, if it's emotional, whatever it is. And those things can, be, can contribute to each other. Well, who wouldn't be distressed in my position? I'm, it's probably just something I have to fight through. Or I need to be strong. Or maybe I actually don't feel all that comfortable talking to my specific provider about it. Or having a belief that, well, I'm experiencing this, but I've got to deal with this on my own because I don't, I don't think anything's going to help. Even if you have good reasons to be distressed, you can still get help. And let's talk about how, how we can do that. Um, I'm sorry, some of this is cut off at the bottom. Uh, but examples of resources for distress. First, family and community. There are lots of uh, support groups in the community for cancer specifically. Spiritual support, either in your own community or there are there are chaplains if, here at SCCA and generally in all hospitals. Your primary medical team is a, really good, is a really good resource to let them know if you're having physical distress or emotional distress because they may be able to work through it with you or and they may be able to refer you to some other folks who can also uh, meet with you and, and address some things. For example, the pain care team, or an integrative medicine team, who you're going to hear about in the next talk. Uh, <clears throat> supportive and palliative care. All of those teams are built to try to reduce distress in some one form or another. And then there's psychosocial supports. Uh, and here at SCCA, we have social workers who do in-person meetings with patients and even phone check-ins. Individual psychotherapists. And then psychiatrists, which are, <laughs> I cut myself off at the bottom, apparently. <clears throat> we get this question a lot. What's a psychiatrist? How's that different from a, a th psychologist? Psychologists generally are folks who have a doctoral degree, like a PhD. They've done research in behavioral health, and they're very trained in many aspects of different types of psychotherapies. Uh, and there are many different types of psychotherapies that we can tailor to what's the specific thing we're trying to target. Psychiatrist, and I'm one of them, is somebody who's been to medical school and has medical training, or, or osteopathic school, but has some sort of medical training. And so especially in the context of cancer care, often is working with patients and their primary teams on medications that can be helpful for if it's mood, if it's anxiety, if it's sleep, those kinds of things. Psychiatrists also tend to do uh, therapy as well, but uh, often we're, we get referred folks to talk about medications. There are things that you can start on your own uh, if you feel like you're having some distress. Even, before you, even if you want to meet with somebody, you can still start with some things on your own. <clears throat> I'll talk about some relaxation techniques just in general. The basis behind this is an anxiety is, is a combination of mind-body experiences. 
we have that, you've probably heard of that fight or flight response. It's this ancient part of our brain that if something like a bear is chasing after us, our brain triggers us to have a surge of adrenaline in our body so that our heart can start pumping fast and we can run away. Well, what happens in anxiety is that that same part of our brain is being triggered, but it's a bit too, maybe too sensitive because there isn't a bear chasing us. It's just something else, but it's starting our heart pumping and we get like clammy hands and it's hard to breathe. So that's what's happening. We're getting this overactive response in our, in our brains and our systems. So relaxation techniques can help calm both the mind part of that and the body part of that. Practice though is essential. It's like any other skill, like playing an instrument, like learning a sport. We have to practice it to get better at it and to make it work as well as it can. One, uh, one tactic, one relaxation practice is diaphragmatic breathing and there are various forms of this. So this is a very basic form of it, but the trick is to breathe slowly and deeply. Let your body rise so we're not just breathing out of our chest, but we're really filling our lungs by letting our, our belly rise. Inhale longer than exhale. I usually tell my patients to Try inhaling for about four seconds and exhaling for about six seconds, but make sure you're doing it slowly. S schedule this. Even if you're feeling okay at that moment, schedule it about twice a day, two or three times a day, just into your schedule and do it for a few minutes. And that can overall bring down our level of anxiety. And then you can do it, especially if you're practiced at it, you can do it any other time of day that you're feeling more anxiety. There's various mindfulness techniques, and mindfulness in general is a kind of a moment by moment, non-judgmental awareness of what's going on. There's very, this takes various different forms. Some are, I'm just paying attention to how my body feels in this moment. Some are, I'm paying attention to my thoughts and emotions. Some are, what, what there's a body scan, and it actually goes kind of from head to toe almost of what's that part of my body doing right now. There's mindful movements, there's formal sitting meditation kind of practices. And then there's informal practices of what's happening in the room right now, what am I hearing? I'm just gonna pay attention to that for a few moments or what am I seeing or what am I smelling? And I don't have any, well I don't have any stock in anything or, or, um, or preferences, but there are, there's phone apps that can help with calming and relaxation. Some are free, some at least have free trials that you can try and see what you like. There are YouTube videos about different mindfulness practices uh, or different calming breathing kind of things. So I would encourage you to, to look into those. And then those things are good, but sometimes we really do need, as like any sport or any playing an instrument, we sometimes need a coach or somebody to really help us get through what we're going through. So when do we reach out for help? When we're feeling over, overwhelmed, if it's just it's too overwhelming and I can't feel like I can do this on my own. When treatment itself may be provoking anxiety to the point where I'm having trouble getting to my appointments or I'm having trouble taking my medications, uh, that's important to reach out. When you're noticing that you're feeling down more than just a, a sadness, then it's more than that. There are times or circumstances in our life also where it's just important to let folks know what's going on. So if, if you've had a recent personal loss or if you've had parents or family members die from cancer, that likely is going to affect how, how I'm experiencing my, my process through cancer. And so it's, it's important to let folks know about that. And if you notice a sudden change in your mood or your mental functioning, all of a sudden I'm just not sleeping, or I just can't concentrate on anything, or I just can't get to do the things that I'm used to doing. Let somebody know. And if you do have physical symptoms causing distress, often that's medically related, but sometimes it can be emotionally related too. Uh, I want to end with giving you, sorry this is cut off, um, but this is a really good guidebook. This is from uh, NCCN, which is National uh, Cancer Comprehensive Comprehensive Care Network, 
the Hutch and SCCA are members of this. So what that actually is supposed to say is nccn.org slash patients. And at that website <coughs> is this guidebook, which is free and has a lot of the information that I've talked about today and even more. Um, and so I definitely encourage you to take a look at that. There's even some, uh, there's a distress thermometer where you can take a look at what are the kinds of things I should be thinking about if I'm worried about being having distress. Uh, and that can help start a conversation with your providers and also just give you and your family an idea of what are the things I should be looking out for potentially and uh, who are the people I should reach out to to help, for help. Okay. Um, this is the, the current faculty at, at SCCA who is working on the psychiatry and psychology service, Dr. Fan. I'm pleased and privileged to be one of, of these members and thanks to some of those folks for sharing some of these slides with me. Um, I will, I will end there, though. I don't know. Do I have time for a couple questions if there are any? Sure. So uh, all the way in the back, yes. yes. I found out when I got diagnosed, the best thing for me is I went to a therapist, uh -huh. a Christian therapist, and she kind of like walked me through the things that she kind of knew that I was going to have trouble with because of the word cancer and what it entails. And, and it just really brought my mind to a kind of like a calming effect, you know, just by talking to her and dealing, you know, and talking to having somebody to talk to. And I found that it was very helpful. Okay. Thanks for that. I think every individual is different. And the things that are helpful for us and to help cope can be different based on the individual. So for example, if it's really helpful to talk to somebody through what I'm going through, then, then if you don't have somebody like that that you can find for yourself, then let your care providers know that that's something you would like. And we can help try to figure out that kind of a, a scenario for you. Talking, like I said, talking isn't for everybody either. So there may be other things based on the individual that are helpful. Any other questions right now? OK, thanks very much. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. <laughs> yes, uh, Integrated Medicine is very new here. And I am the newest member. So um, you all know more about the history than I might, even though I'm pretty well uh, versed on what we've been up to so far. I um, am brand new, so we will talk a lot about um, acupuncture today, but we'll also talk about integrated medicine, the program as a whole. This gives a little uh, map for what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to talk about um, just well, my background, where I came from, how I got here a little bit, and uh, some definitions in integrative medicine. Because it is new to SCCA and uh, sort of new to uh, conventional medicine, there are some definitions that separate the different things that we do. And then we'll talk a little about acupuncture from a traditional point of view, and then more from a biomedical point of view. And we'll talk about acupuncture treatments. Um, how many people here have had acupuncture? OK, a handful. Good. And um, we'll talk about some things that acupuncture treats. And if you're interested, I can show you some self-acupressure, a few points for some common conditions and uh, talk about research and integrative medicine more particular. So I've been practicing acupuncture for about 15 years. I went to Bastyr here in Seattle, and then I moved away, and I just came back here from the Cleveland Clinic. And my clinical focus is on, in oncology, mostly treating the side effects of cancer and cancer-related pain, but also all the other things that acupuncture treats, which we don't have to separate out when you're I mean, particularly for um, oncology acupuncture. And the primary focus of what we do is supporting you and your journey through having cancer, survivorship, and improving the quality of life during all stages of that. So integrative oncology is a very new term, a new field. And I'm going to read this directly from the definition from the Society of Integrative Oncology. So integrative oncology is a patient-centered, evidence-informed field for cancer care that utilizes mind and body practices, natural products, and or lifestyle modifications from different traditions 
alongside conventional cancer treatments. Uh, it aims to optimize health, quality of life, and clinical outcomes across the cancer continuum and to empower people to prevent cancer and become active participants before, during, and beyond cancer treatment. You know, and the focus is here is that we are part of your team. We are support, part of supportive services. This isn't instead of your conventional care, and we're here, here really to support what you're already doing and your journey along the way. And here are some of these little definitions that maybe people have heard and what, how it's different and how it's the same. And, you know, traditional therapies are more like maybe like folk medicine and things that we just pass along through the generations that we do for, for different conditions. Alternative therapies tend to mean you're doing this treatment instead of standard care, instead of conventional care. Then for a long time it was complementary therapies. So that's like, okay, I'm going, I'm getting my regular care, but I'm also doing all these other things. And there may not be a lot of commu communication there between you know, your, your physician and nurses and your acupuncturist, your nutritionist, your therapist about everything that's going on in your complete care. But as we've moved through this and we've, we've developed what we do and we improve what we do, the, go the standard now, the gold standard, is integrative medicine. And that's more, we, we look at the evidence. There's been research now. We have some, some idea of things that are more effective and what they do and what things they're good for treating. And we want to include those therapies in with your standard care. And we want everyone talking about it together. And that's why we're here at SCCA now, so that we have really good communication with all your providers and your providers know when to refer to an integrated medicine consult or acupuncture and what kind of things we can help with. And that really is nice when everyone can talk about your whole care and your whole person. All right. So this is my little house, acupuncture. We'll talk about the things that we treat and how does it work? What does it feel like to have acupuncture? And the biggest question we always get is, does it hurt? Does it hurt people who've had acupuncture? Good. <laughs> okay. um, so acupuncture is one part of traditional Chinese medicine. There are numerous things that an acupuncturist or a, a, a Chinese medicine practitioner will do during your treatment. I have another slide with pictures, so we'll talk about it more there. So the term acupuncture, we call it a family of procedure, procedures that involve the stimulation of these acupuncture points on the body, and we can stimulate them in numerous techniques, and that's why we call it a family of procedures. Uh, the procedure that's been most studied is using acupuncture needles in the acupuncture points, either just putting them in manually or also then stimulating them with a small elect electrical field, kind of like what a TENS unit would be, if you've ever used that. So, here's the one with the pictures. So, we just saw acupuncture. I have a pointer here. Okay. So, this would be like the electroacupuncture. So these little clips go on the needles. Uh, with a lot of studies with, uh, with electroacupuncture. So we use that quite a bit here. Acupressure, which we'll be doing this afternoon if you're interested and want to see some points. But these are also small little, we call them seeds, uh, that we use on acupuncture points to stimulate them also with acupressure. A uh, little picture of herbal medicine. We talk about exercise, and exercise is an important part you know, while you're going through treatment and afterwards. The primary exercises that we use in uh, Chinese medicine are Tai Chi and Qigong. And we also talk about diet therapy, particular to your Chinese medicine diagnosis. Uh, some massage techniques like Gua Sha or Tui Na. And we have cupping, which you may have seen in the news during the Olympics, we always see cupping. And then moxibustion is an herb that we, uh, burn, we don't do that here, but it can be burned over acupuncture points to stimulate the points with heat. So there's a lot of different things that we do. So from a traditional standpoint, acupuncture is based on a meridian system. So it's kind of like a highway system through the body. And then we use the acupuncture points to balance the flow of qi, this energy in your body. And then it flows through these meridians. In Chinese medicine theory, pain or illness, any kind of distress arises when that qi doesn't flow freely through the body. So like when there's a blockage, then, then problems start happening. So we use the acupuncture points to redirect that energy through the meridians. 
And there are um, hundreds of acupuncture points, about 360 primary points. They're all over the body. But most of the points that we use during treatment are from the elbows down to the hands, the knees down to the feet, the ears, uh, sometimes the belly or the head. So the meridians, they flow along what we know now are areas where there's connective tissue, myofascial planes, or you may have heard of trigger points. Acupuncture points are areas where there's a lot of fine nerve endings. So when it says stimulate the nerves, we're not actually needling into your nerves because that would not be you know, painless. Uh, but the, the areas where acupuncture points are, there are a lot of fine nerve activity and the tissue when we put the needle in stimulates that. So here we talk about a little bit of research. We can see, so this is a cross section of an arm and the areas where the points are, where these arrows are, a lot of the acupuncture points are in these areas. Fascia is like saran wrap that goes around muscles and there's a lot of connective tissue in these areas where the acupuncture points are. So when we needle those points, this is sort of a zero to seven of an acupuncture needle go going in and then getting manipulated. So at zero, the needle just goes in and sits there. And as we move the needle, if anyone who's had acupuncture knows that we kind of manipulate, manipulate the needle a little bit, and that makes that connective tissue that we saw in the last slide wrap around the needle. Kind of like spaghetti wrapping around a fork. And so it's that wrapping that causes a local reaction. So we're trying to figure out why do these points have such a systemic effect on the body. So that little needle causes a little action around it and pulls on these fibers. And there's things called fibroblasts in there that change shape when this happens. So this is the mechanism of the first mechanism of how acupuncture works and how we can treat so many things. So we're not actually stimulating the nerves, but we're stimulating the nervous system through this small physical whirling effect. Okay. So through all that, we put the needle in, things start happening around it, then a cascade of all kinds of things happen in the body. And this is where we're really starting to hone our research in is what happens with that. We know that acupuncture works on the, like the opioid receptors in our brain because we can block the effects of acupuncture by giving you some medication before that blocks those receptors. So acupuncture releases all those natural feel good like endorphins and caffeines that, um, that make you feel good and also put you into that that state of parasympathetic that we talked about earlier with the bear attacking you, well, that's when you're in sympathetic fight or flight mode. Acupuncture is like a big switch. Those needles go in and it just flips you into that rest and digest and where all kinds of healing happens and there's more calmness, reduced anxiety. And that's how we start to know how acupuncture treats so many different things is because it's working more on the nervous system and all these systems. So these are some of the studies that are coming up of how, what acupuncture does in the body. So nervous system, the endocrine system, it increases blood flow, it releases all these really good and endogenous opioids and neurotransmitters, reduces pain through the gait control theory. It's anti-inflammatory, and we talk about that connective tissue being the pathway that starts all these things happening. So that's what's happening inside your body when acupuncture goes on. But what do you, as the person experiencing acupuncture, how do you feel? This is a picture of acupuncture needles. I describe the acupuncture needle as like a cat's whisker because it's really thin like that, and bendy. So on the bottom we have the acupuncture needle and then that's a sewing needle. So they're pretty small and that's part of why they don't hurt very much. When you come to see an acupuncturist, we do a full intake and medical history. Uh, we ask you a lot of questions that are, that are normal and you're used to getting asked. And then we might ask things that are, you haven't really been asked before. Because we're putting you into Chinese medicine patterns. We're making a diagnosis based on your Chinese medicine patterns and, and imbalances. And from that, we come up with a point selection, an acupuncture point selection, or a point prescription, as we call it. And then we put in the needles about five to 20 per treatment, depending on what we're treating and you know what's going on with you. And the needles stay in for about 30 minutes. Most people fall asleep or at least get very relaxed during that time. 
For those who haven't seen acupuncture, this is what it looks like when a needle is put in. So the needles are in we call guide tubes. So we don't actually touch the part of the needle that's going into your body. The needle is in a tube. They're sterile, single-use, disposable needles. We locate the point, put the guide tube on it, and then we tap the needle. And the guide tube also helps stretch the skin. So when the needle goes in, it goes in very quickly, and that's also why you don't feel very much as the needle goes through that outer layer of your skin. Then we pull off the guide tube, and then we'll start manipulating the needle to make that whorl wrap around. And generally, you won't feel very much. There can be a little pinch sometimes when the needle first goes in. But then once the needle's in, there can be a deep, achy feeling. Not uncomfortable or strong, but you sometimes will notice something is happening. And that's that whirling sensation of the collagen. There's another technique we do without the guide tube. So if you ever have acupuncture and you don't see that tube, that's normal as well. And then acupuncture, you know, it's, it's not just a one-time thing. You do need to have continued treatments, at least in the beginning. The effect of acupuncture treatment is cumulative. So we recommend eight to 10 acupuncture treatments to see what kind of effects it's gonna have for you. Treatments are usually once a week, occasionally twice a week. And then the number of treatments and how frequent, it, it really varies person to person. But we do like to see some kind of you know, notable change after four to five treatments. Then we start to decrease the frequency as you're feeling better, and some conditions may require maintenance once a month, once every six or eight weeks. All right, so what do people come to acupuncture for the most? Pain. Acupuncture is very studied for pain, um, pretty much any kind of pain, but particularly low back pain, neck pain, joint pains, muscle pains. A lot of post-surgical pain research has been done. Nausea, vomiting, loss of appetite, Managing the effects of, of hormonal therapy, whether that's aches and pains or hot flashes, and um, neuropathies, especially when it's from chemotherapy. A lot with digestion, acupuncture is very beneficial for uh, including constipation, whether that's um, from opioids or not, and also loose stools. Headaches is a very common treatment for acupuncture or complaint for acupuncture. Urinary complaints, whether it's frequency, incontinence, or retained urine, or pain with urination. Xerostomia dry mouth, often from if you have radiation in your head and neck. Uh, stress, anxiety, insomnia. There are these things we call kind of the side benefits of acupuncture. So often people will come for, um, say, fatigue or nausea and vomiting. Um, and we don't really maybe talk about anxiety so much. And the first thing they come back and say is, well, I'm still nauseous, but I just feel much more calm. I just feel better. And so that's that, how acupuncture helps get you into that parasympathetic mode. And it goes very, along very well with other integrative medicine techniques like relaxation and meditation, which we'll get to. So acupuncture is very safe. Um, that's one thing that we really have going for us. There's very few adverse events with acupuncture. This is a very large, it's a German study of um, 760,000 treatments. And there was 3.28% uh, of adverse events of needling pain, 3% of, uh, you know, like a bump where the needle was. 1.3% uh, with bleeding, and by bleeding, it's like a drop of blood. We use a Q-tip to take it off. So really not a lot of uh, major events. There was um, a hypertensive crisis, exacerbation of depression, someone had an asthma attack, and a vasovagal, like, um, you know, feeling faint reaction. So acupuncture is very safe when it's given by someone who is trained and licensed. Um, this is a study on acupuncture for nausea and vomiting with chemotherapy. And if you remember back in the beginning, I said there's different ways of stimulating the acupuncture points. This study, well, this is a meta-analysis. It's also um, was included in the Cochrane reviews. But it was interesting because this looked at a lot of different ways of stimulating the acupuncture points for chemo-induced nausea and vomiting. And so it looked at electroacupuncture, it looked at studies that were just regular acupuncture, acupressure, and then a little electrical unit kind of used as acupressure, but without the needle. And uh, so we think that electroacupuncture is probably the best for acute vomiting. 
and acupressure is actually one of the most effective for nausea. So I'm going to show you that one in case anyone needs it. Um, acupuncture has been studied over and over for chronic pain. In 2012, there was this very large study which was then um, expanded on in 2018. And I think one of the highlights of this, that I had, why I keep it in here, is that the effects of acupuncture persist over time with only a small decrease, 15% in treatment effect in a year. So as opposed to other, some other treatments that may have really good effect at the time and then wear off, their studies are showing that acupuncture, the effects last very long after your treatment ends. There have been many studies on acupuncture for post-operative pain, vomiting, recovery after surgery, using less anesthesia, less painkillers, and so often the acupuncture is given before surgery, not, not just after. Okay. Does anyone want to see um, some acupressure points to help with? Okay. Here we go. So acupressure, as we said, you're just stimulating the points. You can use anything. You can use another, you know, a finger to uh, stimulate the acupressure point. And what's great about this is you saw how small an acupuncture needle is. And our fingers are infinitely larger than that. So you're always going to find the acupuncture point. So don't worry about that. I'm going to show you how to find them. But always keep in mind that this finger is much bigger than a sewing needle. So you can do acupressure on yourself. You can do it to a friend. You can't overdo it. You can't do too much acupressure. I don't recommend that you do it to the point where it really hurts. If it's causing discomfort, you either stop or just back off and don't do it as hard. And of course, if the symptoms get worse or persist, then you, know, you might want to talk to your uh, health care provider about that and not just keep, keep trying acupuncture, acupressure forever. But we are going to talk about the point for nausea. All right, so I'm going to pull this bracelet off. So the main point that was studied and we use a lot for nausea is on the inside of your wrist. Okay, so if you take your one hand and you use three fingers, your pinky never counts. I don't know why. This picture is like this, and that's the easiest way to do it. So you have your three fingers here, and then where your thumb lands, that's how far down your, the wrist the point is. Now, you guys feel two tendons there, two ropey things? The point is right between those. So what I recommend is if you do the acupressure up and down this way, and you stay in that groove between the tendons, with your big thumb, you're going to get that point. And as you start to do it, you're going to feel an area that might be a little bit more tender, maybe a little achy. That's the point. So you can do acupressure for 30 seconds to 3 minutes on one side, usually a minute or two. And then switch to the other side. So do the same thing on the other side. Did everyone find it? Questions? Good. So it's different for everyone. Don't want to cause discomfort, but you do want it to be a strong sensation. So I, you know, for me personally, I do them rather strong because I, I'm used to the needles where it really gets in there and you can, I can feel it. So um, like if I were having nausea, I might start out a little stronger, and as it started to get better, I might do it a little bit less. But you can usually feel just an achiness. It shouldn't be sharp. It shouldn't hurt at all. Okay. That's that one. And then the next one we're going to do is for headache. It's, it's a primary point for headache, but it's also good for pain in general. This point is one of the most commonly used acupuncture points. And there's a few ways that you can locate it. It's in this web of your hand that real kind of meaty part. So you can just stick your other thumb right in there and you'll feel a little tenderness. That's the area. So you can either just, you, got, you definitely got it there. No, so maybe a little, less, a little less pressure. So you can either just squeeze it or you can make little circles or kind of, we call this juicing or pumping on the point. And same thing, you can just go back and forth one to the other. Now, if you're using it for headaches, 
and even for nausea, you're going to have better results if you start doing it at the early signs of starting to feel nauseous or starting to have a headache. Um, but it helps even if you're deeper into the throes of it. Okay. We have one point here for anxiety. This is also a very common point. It's very easy to find. It's right between your eyebrows. Now this is a thinner skinned area, not as much muscle here, so you might not want to press as hard. People often like little circles here. This is a nice one to do if you're also doing some kind of relaxation, like while you're doing your diaphragmatic or your belly breathing. You can compare them together. Double action. So as I said, acupuncture is just one part of our integrative medicine program here at SCCA. And here, we are part of the supportive care team. And these are all the spokes of the wheel. And we have um, integrative medicine, um, pain management, palliative care, psychiatry, social work, spiritual health, <coughs> physical therapy, nutrition, and the survivorship clinic are all part of supportive care. We are a small team so far. We're brand new. Uh, we have a naturopathic physician, a nurse practitioner who does a lot of our mind-body medicine, um, two acupuncturists, and our clinical manager. Our naturopathic physician is also the director of the program, Dr. Heather Greenlee. She sees patients for naturopathic consults, and she can help put together a whole plan, you know, evaluate and guide you on a, a path of kind of what's the evidence-informed plan for you. You know, particularly what is going on with you and what things we have to offer um, that you can do on your own or incorporate from our other uh, supportive care and integrative medicine um, providers. But a lot of it is also going over what supplements you may take, looking at nutrition and uh, how physical activity may um, be beneficial for you. And then Kathy Sanders is a nurse practitioner. She is trained in many different um, modes of mind-body medicine, so different kinds of relaxation techniques. Um, Mindful-based stretch stress reduction is one technique that she does. She'll do um, guided imagery or uh, clinical hypnosis or hypnotherapy. She also does auricular acupuncture, so that's just acupuncture of the ear. So it's not the whole body acupuncture, but it's very good for certain conditions. And she can also uh, help you with dietary supplements and knowing what's appropriate for you and what there's good evidence for. Um, we also have yoga classes, and they are uh, Monday and Thursday afternoons over in the clinic. They are suitable for everyone. And Mem is amazing, and she will adjust what she's doing for you, particularly if you have certain restrictions um, that may apply. Everyone's welcome. And of course, acupuncture, I didn't put that in there because we just talked about it quite a bit. So this is our integrated medicine um, page on the website. So if you have questions, you can check that out. There's how to contact us. And I also um, put some materials out on the table about the different things that we offer and where to find us and how to reach us. Yeah? Insurance and Medicare. Yes, insurance and Medicare. It's everyone's favorite topic. <laughs> Do you have specific questions about it? Does it cover? Um, so Medicare does not cover acupuncture at this point. Some Medicaid plans, Medicaid does. Some uh, supplemental plans for Medicare will, so that is patient by patient based. Medicare does cover Kathy Sanders, the, the integrative medicine consult. So that is covered and she does do the auricular acupuncture. Um, same thing with Dr. Greenlee. It's a case by case, depends on the insurance plan. Our um, team coordinators will connect with you and um, confirm your benefits before you come in. Just because it is a new program and, and the insurance is always changing and every plan is different and we don't want anyone to have surprises later on. So they can work with you through that. Yep. At this point, we do not. We would love to treat caregivers. Oh, the question was, um, do we treat caregivers? 
We would love to treat caregivers because they need a lot of support as well. One of the handouts that I have out there is how to find an acupuncturist in your community as well. And we're working um, to build more of a network with the acupuncturists in the community. Because we're so small, we really have limitations of getting our patients in. So as of right now, it is limited just to just patients here at South Lake Union Campus. But we're happy to help find someone for you. Any other questions? All right, excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Susan. That uh, concludes our didactic portion of the program. Um, so before uh, moving on to the last portion, um, the uh, patient support group focused uh, portion, if I can remind you to fill out um, the questionnaires you have uh, on behalf of today's program. Um, if you turn those in, that will give us good feedback uh, for future planning uh, and future meetings. Um, so the last portion of today's program, something we've done uh, in years past uh, that we're, we're um, uh, excited about is to turn the floor over um, to our patients themselves um, and Art uh, and Julie uh, Shimura, who are the coordinators for the local um, kidney and bladder cancer support group um, to lead a discussion um, uh, from the support group standpoint and uh, I think patients coming down here to talk to us about uh, some personal experiences. So I'll turn it over to Art. There's uh, Microphone here, you can you can, uh, can hook that. up with. Yeah. Okay, we've got a microphone there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Are you hearing me? Okay. It says it's on. Okay. Uh, we need Her Henry and Mark. Please come down and take a chair. Basically, Julie, my wife, and myself have been leading a patient support group at Seattle Cancer Care Alliance for a number of years. And these are some of our friends that have come to our meetings, typically from 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock in the afternoon on a Saturday. And one of the things we find at those meetings is that the real benefit is not when I put up a PowerPoint slide showing some of the latest drugs. It's when the patients start talking to each other and sharing information of what they have learned from their doctors. So that's what we're going to try and do a little bit right here. And I've given them a, a list of some specific questions I was going to ask so they get a little bit prepared ahead of time. Uh, is the microphone on, Julie? I think so. You have to probably hold it closer to your chin. Oh. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. First question is, how and when did you learn that you had kidney cancer? Well, I'll go first, I guess. Um, so I was diagnosed December 7th of 2000, and I uh, saw a radiologist and a urologist, and they both told me I had 18 months to live because I had a tumor in my right kidney, which was right in the middle, and they had to take it out and uh, that was supposed to be the end of it, but they gave me this horrible prognosis of 18 months. So, you know, I was shocked. I was depressed, really depressed. Um, and I, I guess with the help of my husband, he found some kidney cancer support groups that were, what, national? Um, that he dragged me off to. We flew, I think, to Houston, went to one, and Washington, D.C., and... We went all over the place and I found wonderful people that had the same cancer that I did. It wasn't that I was happy, it was just that I felt so good to be among somebody else who had this. So that really helped me on my recovery with the depression. Um, did you want me to? Well, let's go hand on? it over to Henry and ask him how he learned that he had Henry. kidney cancer and when. <clears throat> So nearly uh, five and a half years ago, April of uh, 2014, I was out on my uh, lunch break doing my two-mile walk, and I come back and go to the bathroom, and I peed pure blood, and it was just shocking. Uh, I immediately got a hold of my uh, primary care physician, 
I belong to the Poly Clinic, and uh, they checked me for infection, no infection, and they sent me to a neurologist, and it came to the CT scan part of it, and he brings this uh, scan picture in, he shows me my right kidney, and there's this thing the size of a tennis ball on it, huge. Uh, and uh, a few days later, I had a neophractomy on my right kidney, took the whole thing out. Um, and there was uh, some lymph nodes that were enlarged, locally, local lymph nodes that were enlarged, but they were so close to my vena cava, he didn't want to attempt to surgically remove them because he might nick the vena cava and I'd bleed to death. So the idea was to monitor uh, these things with a CT scan, and for six months or so, they were you know, about a centimeter. Now, normal lymph nodes are around a half a centimeter. These things were about a centimeter, 1.2, and they started enlarging slowly. Uh, then a few months later, they noticed some lymph nodes in my chest starting to grow. So I had a needle biopsy done where they go down to your throat and prick these lymph nodes, and no, they're not cancerous. Well, the next CT scan shows the lymph nodes are still growing, so they surgically went down and removed some of the lymph nodes, and sure enough, they were cancer. So uh, the kidney cancer had metastasized. So then I started the uh, suit and treatment, and I guess we'll... We'll get into that get in the question later. Okay, pass it to Mark. And Mark, not only how and when did you learn, but where did you learn? Because that's kind of interesting. I live in, in Ketchum, Idaho. It's, you probably heard of Sun Valley, the ski resort. It's a, a town of about 4,000 people in the mountains in Idaho, but, but because it's a ski resort, it's got a pretty high level of uh, uh, local medical care. Um, I had a sore shoulder. I went into an orthopedic surgeon's office to have my shoulder looked at. And Justin, who is a radiation tech, said, forget about your shoulder. You've got tumors in your lungs. And I didn't believe him. Uh, so I asked Joanna, who is the, it's a small town. Everybody knows each other by first name. Uh, Joanna is the PA in the, in, in, the, in the orthopedic office. And I said, what's the chance he's right? She said, 100%. You got tumors in your lungs. Uh, go get a chest x-ray, which I did. Uh, and she looked at it and said, you got tumors all over the place. And so I went back to the hospital, got a CAT scan. Bob Hall, who's, who's an internal medicine uh, internal medicine and diagnostics is on a vacation in Hawaii. Uh, Bob comes back from Hawaii. I spoiled his vacation. He looks at the CAT scan and says, you got one chance. Go to Seattle. See this guy, Scott Tycote, MD, PhD, <laughs> at Fred Hutchinson. Get in a drug trial and get lucky. So that's what I did. Good. Let's go to the next question. Oh, wait a minute. There was a question uh, up here. Who, who what, year, what year was that, she asked? That was April 25th, 2015. Okay. Now, if you have any questions, uh, probably raise your hand so I can repeat it into the mic so others can hear. Mark, hang on to the uh, mic for just a second. What did you do next after you got this advice to go to Seattle and talk to Dr. Tycote? I did exactly that. Uh, and and so so Bob's diagnosis. He's a diagnostician. From looking at the CAT scan, Bob said it's it started in your left kidney, so it's going to be kidney cancer. It's going to be clear cell because that's what kidney cancer usually is. And and after I got here, uh, I then went to UW and and had a biopsy, with, and they confirmed his diagnosis basically, but. They said, yeah, this is really bad news. You've got kidney cancer. And I said, well, my, my ski buddy in Ketchum, Idaho, told me that two weeks ago, so I'm not surprised. Uh, but that's when it was, that, that's when it was confirmed. But, but I, I basically knew I had cancer when, from uh, 
<laughs> from the first radiation tech I talked to. Okay, pass it to Julie, please. So Julie, what did you do after you heard this opinion that you had kidney tumor? Uh, well, I decided to get a second opinion because, uh, first of all, I didn't like the doctor too well. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and because the radiologist and the oncologist kind of ganged up on me and insisted that I have this nephrectomy. So I s saw four other urologists, and they all said the same thing. Until I got a hold of Dr. Thompson at the University of Washington. He was wonderful. He talked to me for 45 minutes, just calmed me down, soothed me all, made it. He said, I know this guy, this doctor. He's um, just got off from being a fellow, and he's really good, and you should go see him. Okay. And more? We, yeah, a little bit more. Okay. So I saw Dr. Porter, and some of you know Dr. James Porter, and uh, he confirmed the diagnosis after looking at my x-rays, but he said, so what is this on your other kidney? And sure enough, it was another tumor sticking up on my other kidney. Imagine what I was feeling. If I would listen to those first five doctors, I'd be suffering with one partial kidney. Pass it on to Henry, please. So Henry, what did you do after you now had determined that you had kidney cancer? Just followed my oncologist's advice from then on. <laughs> <in his hands. laughs> um, and uh, as I said, when we learned it had metastasized into my chest, I started Sutent and um, was on that for about a year. And it did shrink immediately, the tumors. Uh, I, the, the lymph nodes weren't large, you know, centimeter to 1.2 centimeters, but did get them down to the decimal points, so I was down to 0 0.8, 0 0.9. And it was holding them there for about a year, and then they started to grow again, and it started to metastasize otherwhere. I started getting lesions in uh, my lungs, my liver, my thyroid, my knee, my brain, and I got a story for all of those. <laughs> so I've touched about most of the stuff we've talked about through my last five and a half years. Uh, dealing with this. So Henry, um, you, be, you did more than just the treatment with Sutent. What other treatments did you do? Well, from uh, Sutent, uh, this is one, uh, the immunotherapy. I was right in that 2015 where things were shifting to immunotherapy and I went on the Optivo or the Nivolumab, uh, and that was heaven compared to Sutent. Uh, you know, the sutin, it's three weeks on, one week off. You're near death for uh, near the third week, puking and uh, diarrhea, and you can't eat. And then you get a weak reprieve, and you're just about getting back to normal, and then you're back on the sutin again, getting all sick with these side effects. So on the Optivo, no side effects whatsoever. And for a year, it was uh, heaven, and it was holding everything in check. Uh, uh, pretty much, but then the metastasis to my stomach occurred because I was getting very fatigued and uh, I couldn't do my two mile walk. I'd walk about 100 meters and I'd be exhausted. And my blood count showed that my red blood cells count was going down. And they determined I was bleeding somewhere. And sure enough, after uh, endoscopy, they found a uh, tumor in my stomach. And that's, that's a story in itself. How much? Why don't you go ahead with that? Is that the <laughs> hospital? <laughs> so, so now I have a tumor in my stomach. And uh, I was, my oncologist uh, sent me to a radiologist. Uh, and they decided they could uh, radiate this thing in my stomach. That's pretty difficult. Your stomach is kind of folds and moves around a lot. And as the... Uh, the the gal, the radiologist, was talking about earlier, they had these ways of pinpointing this radiology to get this tumor 
in the middle of my stomach, uh, and it was it was about a centimeter and a half, and uh, I think it was uh, four or five treatments. They radiated the thing, and it nailed it, and uh, I recovered from that. Um, but next it was uh, where did it, oh then it got into my bones. So that's another story. Tell the bone story. Sure, tell the bone story. <laughs> so uh, I'm still on the um, Updevo, and uh, I fell off a ladder and uh, broke my wrist, and um, got that taken care of. Uh, they put a plate in my wrist and sewed it up. But uh, something was going on with my knee; uh, it was very sore, and I thought I had bumped it when I fell off the ladder. So I didn't pay much attention. It's just, it's, it's going to get better. It's going to get better. But it kept getting worse and worse. So I made an appointment with an orthopedic in the poly clinic. He does a bone scan. And now I've got the uh, metastasized to my left knee. Um, and there was a big piece of my knee, uh, the inside of my knee, eating, being eaten away. And uh, so... He said it was up to me, uh, I would do a surgical treatment and scrape it all out. But uh, uh, I have other issues going on, uh, and it might be better if you consult with your oncologist and go on to the um, Zamata, which is another Malco drug that uh, halts the cancer in the bones. So I've been on Zamata since then, I guess it's about three and a half years, and then it hasn't progressed to my knee. Uh, by having fully recovered, I can't do um, vigorous exercise. I can't ski anymore, but uh, I'm pretty, it's fairly tolerable, so I'm okay with that. But the, the orthopedic surgeon says you better walk around with crutches because you've weakened this, and I just could not get to the idea of walking around with crutches, and I took the risk. And I've never used crutches, and I haven't. My knee hasn't collapsed on me yet. So, uh, but uh, that 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 was short-lived. Uh, the uh, Updevo was now giving up on me, and uh, they, they were discovering lesions in other parts of my body. My, uh, as I mentioned, my lungs and liver. Uh, in addition to the one they just killed in the stomach, and the knee. And um, the lymph nodes were still uh, sitting there, and then I, then I got my one of my throat, my thyroid, and <clears throat> so where we go from here? The the suitin type drugs aren't working, the immunotherapy is not working, and uh, so I was with one of these sessions about three years ago, and I heard Dr. Zhang talk about the scalpel effect with radiation and nivolumab, and I said geez, I'm going to go for that. And I met with uh, Dr. Rangan, and we discussed uh, what was required, and they said, well, we'll have to do an MRI on your brain because you can't have any brain tumors to go get into this trial. So I have an MRI, and lo and behold, I got a bloody tumor in the, right in the middle of my brain. It's about a centimeter and a half. <laughs> and I said, well, <laughs> where do we go with this? <laughs> he said, we'll send you back to uh, a radiologist. Uh, that was the gal that spoke earlier. Uh, and she worked out a plan to radiate my brain. And, um, yeah, it's, it's quite, quite a deal. They made a special mold to bolt my head down so it wouldn't move. And they pinpointed this thing right in the center of my brain. And they zapped it good. And uh, the next MRI, the thing was almost gone. Uh, and uh, so um, that was good, uh, but uh, we're getting to near the present. It was about six months ago. I'm in for an MRI. I do them every three months, and all of a sudden the brain tumor's back to its original size and larger. This is about six months ago, and so they tell me it's. Um, Radiation agitation, not necessarily the tumor grow, growing. So I've, we've been monitoring it, and it's been sitting at that same size, and it hasn't grown yet. Uh, so I'm hoping it's just the radiation inflammation. 
Uh, that's the gamma knife I had. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, and I, I had my knee radiated also when they uh, they pinpointed my knee and radiated my knee, and plus the zamata uh, to take care of the knee. Um, so everything's stable right now. The uh, the thyroid uh, uh, has been stable, uh, and my uh, lymph nodes are stable. My liver lesions are stable. My lung lesions are stable, and I had two other little spots in the brain also uh, that they radiated. There's three spots in the brain that are radiated. They were very small. They were on the order of a couple, two or three millimeters, but they zapped them, and I've never seen them again, just a large one that seemed to get, hopefully, a radiation uh, flare-up reaction. But uh, I'm still here. Still going, and I love these guys. Okay, you look great. I love, <laughs> I love these, these, these guys who dedicate their life to medicine. <laughs> probably, you know, if I, this happened about 10 years ago, I probably wouldn't be still be here. And thanks to these guys, I'm still here. How old are you? I'm 74 in, in the next month. Right. So, Jude. <laughs> Yeah, country and western, probably. <laughs> Julie, so now you've uh, found Dr. Porter. What happened to you? You had a tumor in your right kidney, and you had a tumor in your left kidney. Yep. And so he decided that um, he would zap the tumor that was easy to access on my uh, left kidney. But the other one, he said, was giving him uh, palpitations. So um, we waited a couple of months and did another x-ray. And uh, he said, you know, there's this um, research going on at NCI. And since my father had died of kidney cancer, um, maybe I'd qualify for uh, some of this research that they were doing. So we, uh, we headed back to... Um, to go through a whole series of tests for a whole week. I mean, they put me through everything. Lo and behold, they found another tumor growing. So they wanted to do surgery. I said, no, no, I'm coming back. I'm going to have Porter do it. And uh, so he did. But he left the big one for uh, open surgery, which I had after that. Um, I never had a robotic surgery. I wish it was would have been available back then, but you know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm still here after 19 years, so I feel pretty good about that, having portions of both my kidneys. Maybe a follow-up to that. How did you feel after they came back and you'd had two tumors removed, and now they found a third one back in Washington, D.C., and they wanted you to have it taken out right there, right then? Were you a little depressed? Was I depressed? <laughs> God. I thought, oh, this is it. This is really it. This is what's going to happen. I'm going to be just like my father. I'm going to die from this thing. And the doctor says, well, it's a pretty simple procedure. We can take it out. Um, doing the open surgery, that's where they practically cut you in half. Um, and I said, no, I'm... I'm going back to Seattle. I mean, if that's where I'm going to die, that's where I'm going to be. So, so Dr. Porter then cut you Porter. open, took out one <laughs> of your ribs to get access. Yeah, it wasn't so bad after all. I mean, it was, you know, but, but at least, I mean, it, there was no residual tumors. Well, I do have a, tumors in my pancreas, my liver, and my lungs but they're pretty stable. Um, two, well, I had several in my pancreas, and this one doctor at the University of Washington removed two of them, but he couldn't get to the other ones that are too deep in the pancreas. So, um, so, so far, I'm pretty stable. Okay, Mark. So now you've uh, made contact with Dr. Tycote. How did it go from there? He got you into a clinical trial, but you were living down in Sun Valley. I was in Sun Valley, but I had a, place, I had a house here. I, I grew up in Seattle, and I had a place to stay in Seattle, so I came here. 
and stayed. The first thing we did was we radiated a couple of, of, of skeletal tumors, the one on my arm that took me to the, or the beaks off in the first place, and one on my lumbar spine. That took a, a few weeks, and then I started the Checkmate 214 trial that you've seen up there, the ipilimumab and, and nivolumab, and, and I, have, I have had Zometa all through this period, too, uh, like Henry did. But uh, uh, my experience with the, with the trial, I, I don't know if Henry was in the trial. I was, I was in, in the, the Ipi and Nevo trial before it was approved as, as treatment for kidney cancer. But um, in the, I started that in, in June of 2015. So after three months, uh, the tumors had shrunk 60%. And after three years, they were still at 60% down. And then they started growing again. Um, but the other thing that had changed over that period of time, initially when I came in, um, I said, well, what options do we have? And it was just, well, we can radiate these two, but, but either the drugs are going to take out the other ones or they're not. You don't really have any other options. And, and so when, when the tumors started growing again or, or when, when the two immune therapy drugs had, had, had lost their effectiveness, um, Dr. Taikori said, well, what do you think about surgery? And I said, well, surgery wasn't an option, you said. He goes, well, that was three years ago. Now it is. So I met Dr. Suka, who I was sitting next to here, uh, and, and she took out my left kidney where the primary tumor was. So I thought... I had a mess of tumors. I don't know if anybody's ever had as many tumors as Henry, but um, I don't know how many I had because I never got a count. But, uh, but I had a lot, although maybe not as... I, Henry probably has the record. But now that I, my primary has been removed, what's left is, is uh, some little tumors that are less than a centimeter. And, and I never had one in my brain, and I never had one in my pancreas, the two things I was the most worried about. Uh, but so the tumors I have left now are, are, uh, are small. And, and, and now, because <laughs> my first directive was go get into a drug trial, uh, so now I'm in another drug trial of uh, uh, cabometics and... and uh, uh, a drug that doesn't have a name yet, uh, PT2977. How do you feel about drug trials in general, having gone through the 214? Did they treat you well? I brought this just out of... This is the boarding passes that I ended up with in Seattle in my bedside table. Um, there's another stack like this in Idaho. Um, but Bristol Myers paid for all these. I was back and forth every week, and 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 they paid for all of it. So uh, when people talk about big pharma, um, I got a pretty soft spot for big pharma. I'm I'm uh, I'm happy to be here, and they've treated me really well. And I and the trial that I'm in now is. Uh, more or less the same thing. I haven't done a lot of traveling on this trial yet, but, but uh, I, my experience with trials has been 100% positive. Very good. Pass to Julie, please. So Julie, you've had a lot of surgeries, but no systemic therapy per se, but you still had to deal with the fact that you know your cancer is not gone. How do you deal with that? I think it's gone. <laughs> what can I say? So how'd you get involved in starting a support group? Oh, right. Well, that has really helped me a lot. Um, I think it was 2003. Uh, 
somebody at the Kidney Cancer Association talked Art and I into starting a support group. And we've been doing it ever since. We have about five or six meetings per year. And um, we get, I don't know, from 10 to 18 people sometimes. Sometimes we have speakers. Sometimes we just talk amongst ourselves. And, and we get a lot from each other uh, with people sharing, you know, like Henry and Mark. Uh, they come occasionally. And we just get a lot out of just hearing their stories and, you know, what the next step is and so on. So, so that's what I've been doing. Pass it to Henry, please. So Henry, the one thing you haven't talked about yet was your trip to the emergency room and your stay in the hospital. Uh, yeah. Um, after Optivo, uh, about a year, a little over a year, it was, it was quitting on me and the lesions were growing. And this is uh, when I was hoping for a trial, into the trial with uh, Dr. Rangan to explore this escapal effect of the, nivolumab and radiation, and they found the brain tumor. So uh, while I was there in this center here, I went and talked to Dr. Cody. I don't know if you remember, but he had a trial that he was starting with uh, nivolumab and something else. I can't remember what it was. And I went back to my uh, oncologist and told him my uh, experience. And uh, this is Dr. Lee. He know, knows you. I think he's, he said he might have probably gone to school with you. but. Uh, he knows uh, Dr. Cody is well known in Seattle area here. And uh, he says, yeah, that's a good idea. We'll put you on something new, uh, Cobomatics. And um, so I started Cobomatics at 60 milligrams. And after the first month, I was, thought I was dying. I mean, I, I, I couldn't eat. I couldn't. I was, my guts were coming out of my rear end. I mean, this was, it was just terrible. And I was in this situation where I'm going to beat this. I, I'm, I'm not, my wife says, call Dr. Lee, will you? No, I'm going to beat this. I'm going to make this. I'm going to make it. And it got to the point where I couldn't even walk. I couldn't drink anything. I couldn't eat. And I went to see uh, uh, Dr. Lee, and he uh, sends me over to UW uh, to get a bunch of testing done. And uh, turned out I had an inflamed colon. And I was extremely dehydrated at this point. So they wanted to uh, put me in the hospital and monitor me and get some fluids into me because I couldn't take any fluid. I couldn't drink or eat anything because it, it it, 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 the pain in my colon was unbearable. So I'm in the hospital. I'm in there with a roommate. And the next day, uh, there's a lot of fussing and talking. And they moved him out of there. Uh, what's going on? Then the next thing I know is, the nurses and doctors are wearing hazmat suits when they come in to see me. <laughs> and uh, they're just saying, you know, this is just a precaution because you have a lot of diarrhea. And I, uh, Dr. Lee comes around to see me uh, the next night, and I said, they took my roommate away, and they, they're all looking at me with hazmat suits. And he says, yeah, I've had a great discussion with him. I'm telling him, trying to tell him that it's just the side effects of the... Uh, therapy I'm on, and, and well, the hospital thought I had cholera or something, and they <laughs> weren't taking any chances, and so they had me totally isolated. Uh, but uh, uh, after four days, I, I recovered where I could leave the hospital. Uh, yeah, so that was quite an experience. So Henry, you just had a vacation trip. You want to tell them about that? Oh, the one, the one thing I'd like to uh, suggest here to any of the doctors that are left. You know, when they first discovered the tumor, it was the size of a tennis ball. And I said, how the heck did that go unnoticed? And they said, it's probably been there five or six years to get to that size. And I had no clue until that I peed blood all of a sudden. But yet, in retrospect, I started thinking about it. And you know, I said, you know, I would had some funny GI issues for the last couple of years. That might have been a precursor to this thing or some kind of a symptom. But I think the profession ought to concentrate on 
because uh, most of these tumors are found by accident. You come in and get a CT scan or an X-ray for some other issue, uh, and, and they discover you've got cancer. Uh, probably if they re asked all the patients to think about the years that led up to this, if there's anything they noticed, the change in uh, their, their health of some kind. I wonder if there's symptoms, pre-symptoms, that are out there uh, so you don't have to accidentally discover you've got cancer. Because I imagine if I had known this thing, well, my wife, Basha, she's not here. She, she just couldn't get up this morning. Um, uh, a year before uh, I had diagnosis of the cancer, I had some blood in my urine. It was a rust color, and uh, there was a burning associated with it, and it went away within a few days. And I thought that was just an infection. That might not have been. I might have probably should have gone in and seen a urologist at that point. But all these tumors I've had, there's no distinct symptom. But there's probably subtle symptoms out there. Uh, if enough research is done, maybe they can catch these things earlier. Because uh, I asked my oncologist, I said, why, why not, you know, at the age of 55, everybody have a MRI or CT scan once a year? Because uh, they surely would have discovered this tennis ball uh, a lot earlier. And he said, well, they, they've thought about it and tried it, but you've got a lot of things that are growing inside you that are not necessarily malignant and it would cause a lot of activity, wasteful activity attended to because every little lesion in your body, oh, oh, it might be cancer and you go through all kinds of tests and even surgery uh, that's unnecessary. So that's not, uh, this is my understanding why they don't uh, advocate something like that. But uh, the key I think is probably everybody here knows the earlier you catch this thing, the better off you're going to survive it. Uh, so, Henry, you just got back from your trip. Tell them where you're Oh, at. yeah. I just got back from Norway, uh, most beautiful place on Earth. We took a cruise from Oslo all the way to the North Cape in Norway and back down and visited a half a dozen fjords uh, up, going up and going down, and it's, it's a magical place. I've been all over the world, and that's probably the uh, most beautiful p part of this Earth I've ever seen. These fjords are... It's, it's just like fairy tale. Beautiful, lush, green pastures hugged into these magnificent, jagged, uh, pure mountains. Uh, and it's like you're in uh, fairy tale land. And there's just one after the other of these fjords. And also, we spent a week in Scotland. And the uh, highlands in Scotland are just as beautiful. Uh, but they're more, you have to get to them by land, and, which we did. We drove around through them. Yeah, so, uh, and, and I've never been depressed or thought of had any of those psychological issues. When I, when I was diagnosed, my wife had to be, been in the clinic to see her, one of her ologists of some sort, I can't And we bumped into each other and I says, hi, hi, sweetie, I got, I've got cancer. And she was shocked and went into immediate, uh, I said, don't worry about it, we'll, we'll deal with this. It, it, I, I've never... And uh, we kept a normal life, you know, right after I learned that and started suiting. We were on a cruise from uh, Hong Kong to Singapore. And I'm sitting there in Hong Kong, suiting, uh, depraved. And my wife says, no, I got us a nice uh, uh, restaurant we're going to go to. And we're on this 30th floor of this restaurant overlooking Victoria Harbor. I don't know if you've been in Hong Kong and all the beautiful lights. And I ordered this uh, soft shell crab, a big bowl of it. I said, no, I, I can eat anything. Yet. And I took the first bite of that crab, and I had to throw the whole Because the soup, which just destroyed my appetite. I had to throw the whole bowl of crabs away. <laughs> but it did. It, it, I never got depressed or anything about it. I just continued on with my life. And I think in the last five years, we've cruised about every spot in the earth. It's, life is wonderful. That's Thanks great. to all these doctors. I mean... I'm so glad there's people dedicate their life to this profession. Great. Thank you. Pass it to Julie, please. So there's a, an amazing story of how to keep going in spite of all the hardships. Julie, what kind of thing do you want to tell everybody about how to deal with this and where to go from here today? Well, I would say if you have 
always wanted to go somewhere like Henry did, then go. Do not wait. And no matter what the cost is, just do it. Um, because uh, we kept putting stuff off and putting stuff off, and finally we just said, we just, we're just going to do this, you know. And you feel better, and, I mean, you get away, and you don't think about all the stuff back home. Okay. Mark, do you have any uh, parting thoughts you want to give to the group? No, weirdly enough, here, uh, I suppose some people may have a difficult uh, time emotionally with this. I asked Bob uh, at one point if, uh, if he suggested I take uh, uh, an antidepressant. I've known a couple of other guys who had, who had uh, terminal cancer who I thought an antidepressant was the greatest idea I'd ever seen for them. He said, no, your serotonin level is fine. You don't need that. I don't think I ever did either. I still teach skiing in Sun Valley. I've, I've skied. I've skied 100 days a year for probably 40 years. And since I've been commuting, I don't quite get 100 days in, but I still ski every day. And I teach still because, not because I need the money. I never got much money for, <laughs> for doing that. But I met a lot of interesting people, and I had a good time. And it's fulfilling. It's uh, uh uh, I probably enjoy teaching as much as I enjoy free skiing anymore, but I still do all that. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, I, I keep doing what you're doing. Okay, well, our next meeting of our support group is going to be on Saturday, September 14th, from 1 to 3, over here at Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. And... Uh, we actually, Julie sends out a notice to people on her mailing list. And if you're not on her mailing list already and you want to get on it, we've been passing out some of her business cards, which have her email address on it. Send her an email, and she'll put you on a list so that you'll know when we're having our meetings. And we typically do a recap after the meeting as to what we've heard from Henry and what we've heard from Mark. And uh, it's usually pretty, pretty enlightening. So I want to thank you all for coming. We want to thank Dr. Tycote for making this possible. Let's give him a great round of applause. Thank you all for coming again.